Welcome everybody to my series on probability and statistics. I, as always, am Dr. Lathram. So let's get started today on our topic of expected value. So really the motivating idea for expected value is that you are finding the, the center of mass of something. In particular, we'll be finding the center of mass of our probability distributions. So suppose that we are going to place a different number of unit weights um, along different points along a particular ruler. The question we could ask, and it kind of has physical significance, is where would we put the string in order to make the ruler balance? So physics has already kind of given us the answer to this. If we let W sub i be the weight that we have at position x sub i on the ruler, then the balance point x bar is going to be given by <coughs> this expression. So the numerator of this expression looks like a product of the amount of weight that we have times the position that we have it in, all of that divided by our total amount of weight. So if we take this total amount of weight and move it inside the first summation, we can write this expression as the sum from 1 to n for our total number of weights of x sub i times p sub i, where p sub i is going to be wi over the total amount of, this, of weight that we have. So in essence, the p sub i are proportional weights. And so we maybe actually can think of these p sub i's as being elements of a probability distribution itself. All right, so now let's talk about expected value. So we can go ahead and define it. Now, of course, we've got two cases, one for the continuous case and one for the discrete case. So let's deal with the discrete case first. If y is a discrete random variable with PDF given by P of y, then the expected value of y is defined to be the sum over all possible values that y can take of y times the probability that y occurs. Now, in all of this, so we said that our sample space for the discrete variable could be um, finite or it could be countably infinite. If we've got a countably infinite um, set, then this is actually an infinite series. And so we want to put a summation a condition on this thing so that our summation will actually converge and we can get a real number out of this thing. And so that condition will be that the sum of the absolute value of y sub i times p of y actually exists. So this thing is really saying that it converges absolutely. In the continuous case, um, we get something that's pretty similar, that the expected value of y is given by the integral from minus infinity to infinity of y times f of y dy, where f of y is again going to be the PDF of y. Okay, again, this is going to be subject to a condition that if we look at the absolute value of the y's times this PDF um, and we take the integral, over on the entire real line that this integral actually exists. So now what if we've got y being a discrete random variable with a PDF p of y and we do a change of variables so we let z be a function of y. Okay, then how, how does that affect the expected value of z? Well, as it turns out, it really doesn't change things that much. The expected value of z is just going to be a summation over all possible y values that we can have of g of y times p of y. Okay, so let's see why that might work. Okay. The trick is actually seeing um, how we can get the PDF of z. Well, the probability that z is equal to little z um, is going to be given by the sum over all over the um, pre-image of z under our function g. Okay, so for all of the y's such that g of y is equal to z, we're going to add those all up. Now, as we do the expected value of z, we're doing a summation of z of z times the PDF of z 
but if we make a substitution, this is going to be the sum over all possible z of z times the sum of these pre-images times y. Well, if we distribute our z in, then what is the value of z? z is really just g of y. And if we sum over all possible z's, then we're going to pick up, as we do in the sum, all possible y's. And so we could really say that this is just summing over all possible y's of g of y times p of y. So what's really going on here is that our pre-images, so our pre-image that we have in this set, so these sets are really our pre-images. The pre-images that we have actually partition our sample space of y into different groups. Okay, so when we partition them into different groups and then when we sum over all possible z's, we end up picking up all possible y's. Now, something that's a little subtle that's going on here um, is that uh, this kind of side note that we have down here, okay? Now, we didn't really bring this to light when we were talking about the summation, but we are really rearranging the terms of our sum. So if this were an infinite sum, then we are rearranging terms, and unless we have absolute convergence, we could get different answers. And so that's part of the reason for um, wanting to get absolute convergence into our definition of um, expected value. So that was the um, discrete case of our random variable. What if we have the continuous case? How, does, how do things change? Well, in fact, they really don't. Um, if z is going to be a function of y, so we're doing a change of variables, then the continuous function, if we let f of y be the PDF of y, then if we look at the expected value of z, then that will just be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y, f of y, dy. Again, assuming that the integral exists. So in our textbook by Mendenhall on page 153, we find the statement for this particular theorem that the proof of the above theorem is similar to that of theorem 3.1, which was what we just proved, um, and so is emitted. Well, the idea of the proof is pretty similar in that the function g, if we look at the pre-images, actually form a partition of the set of real numbers. And so by integrating over all the elements of that partition, we integrate over all real numbers. And so we end up with the kind of the same thing happening as happened in the discrete case. So the proof is actually omitted in the book, but we can do a proof um, for a particular case, okay? So suppose that g is an increasing function and it is differentiable on the real numbers. So what this means is that our function z equal to g of y um, if and only if g inverse of z is equal to y. So it's one to one, it has an inverse, and furthermore the inverse is going to be differentiable. And since it is differentiable, we have the relationship that dz is actually given by dz dy dy. Okay, so this is just our usual um, theorem that we have on differentiable, differentials of functions. So if f represents the PDF of y and f hat is the PDF of z, then for the expected value of z from previous work that we did on random variables, we know that the PDF of z is actually given by the PDF of f evaluated at the inverse function times the derivative of the inverse function. So our inverse function actually given by y equal to g inverse of z. 
And so if we plug this into the integrand, so the expected value of z is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of z times the PDF of z. That's the important thing, the PDF of z. So if we make the substitution that we have above, then the PDF of z is given by f of g inverse of z um, dy dz times dz dy dy times g of y. So z is actually given by g of y here. So what is g inverse of z? g inverse of z is y itself. g of y we have. And so now the derivatives that we have here, these are just reciprocals of one another. And so if you want to um, remember that, look back to a good calculus book reference that dy dz times dz dy, these are inverse functions, so the derivatives will be reciprocals of one another. So they cancel out and become one, and we are left with just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of y, f of y, dy. So now let's look good at a couple of very important properties of expected value. So for the setup, suppose that we've got a constant c, and g of y and h of y are two different functions of our random variable y. So the first property is that the expected value of a constant is just the constant. The second property is that the expected value of a constant times a function of a random variable is the constant times the expected value. And So now let's look at a couple of important properties of expected value. So if we let c be a constant real number, and if we have random variable z, that's a function of y, and w, that's a function, that's a different function of y, then the expected value of the constant is just a constant. The expected value of a constant times z is the constant times the expected value of z. And the expected value of z plus w is the expected value of z plus the expected value of w. Now these two properties together, property two and property three, um, go together to make the expected value something that's mathematically called a linear operator. So linear operator, anytime that you hear that term, really just means that constants can be pulled out to the outside and that the expected and that the um, linear operator will distribute over sums. That's really all that we mean when we say something is a linear operator. So let's see where that, um, let's see if we can prove this theorem. <clears throat> so if y is a discrete random variable with a PDF p of y, then the expected value of c is just going to be the expect the sum over all possible y's of c times p of y. Well now c is just a constant, so we can pull that to the outside of the sum the sum over all y's of p of y was guaranteed to be 1 because we're summing over the sample space. <clears throat> so c times 1 is just c because we've used the fact that summing over the entire sample space is 1. Same kind of thing goes if we have the continuous random variable. If we look at the expected value of the constant, well that's going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the constant times the PDF. Well, it's just a constant, and so by properties of integration, we can pull that constant to the outside, and so we're just integrating over the entire PDF. Well, again, the property that the integrating from minus infinity to infinity of f of y dy is 1, because we're summing over the entire sample space, so we get c times 1, which is just c, and so we have the first property. Likewise, for the second property, if y is a discrete random variable with PDF p of y, then 
if we do the expected value of c times g of y, then that c times g of y, c is just a constant, we can pull it to the outside, summing, so the summation that we have left then is just what we have by the definition of c times the expected value of g of y. And so we have a similar argument for the continuous case. We do the expected value of c of g of y is the integral of minus infinity to infinity of c times g of y. The constant gets pulled to the outside <coughs> and we're left with the constant times the expected value of g of y. And for property c, one more time, we'll start with the discrete case. So the expected value of the sum of two random variables is going to be the expected the sum over all possible y's of g of y plus h of y <coughs> times the PDF. Well, if we distribute the PDF, because we have absolute convergence, we can separate the sums. <coughs> and so the first sum becomes the expected value of g of y. Second sum becomes the expected value of h of y. And, of course, similar arguments hold for the PDF of in the continuous case. So the expected value of g of y plus h of y is the integral of g of y plus h of y times the PDF. But we distribute the PDF, the integral converges, and so we can separate the integrals and by separating the integrals, that is what we mean by the expected value of g of y. The second integral becomes what we mean by the expected value of h of y. And so all of these properties are verified, and so we have the expected value is a linear operator. So we'll get a lot of mileage out of these next couple of definitions. So the first really big definition is what we call the mean of the random variable y. So the mean of the PD, mean of y um, denoted by the Greek letter mu. So mu is equal to the expected value of that random variable. <coughs> the variance of y is defined to be the expected value of the quantity y minus mu squared. And so we denote the variance of y by the value sigma squared, or another kind of a name for an operator, v of y, standing for variance of y. And then the standard deviation is just going to be the square root of the variance. So now let's look at another theorem that will give us an easier way of calculating the variance of a random variable. So if y is a random variable, then the variance can also be calculated as the expected value of y squared minus <coughs> the expected value of y squared. So let's take a look and see why that might necessarily be true. <coughs> Um, if we have the variance of y by definition is going to be the expected value of the quantity y minus mu squared. Well, if we expand y minus mu squared, we get y squared minus 2 mu y plus mu squared. So now taking advantage of the linearity of expected value, we can distribute the expected value across those terms, and so we get the expected value of y squared minus 2 mu times the expected value of y plus the expected value of mu squared. Now, because mu, again, is a constant that we've computed previously to computing the variance, so mu is just some number. We can pull that to the outside. The expected value of a constant is just mu squared. <coughs> And by definition, mu is the expected value of y. So in this term, when we're computing the expected value of y, we get another mu. So this gives us, for the variance, expected value of y squared minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. And so we ended up with the expected value of y squared minus mu squared 
or the expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y squared.